uh, we have two great presentations uh, related to actually more uh, sociopolitical uh, studies. Before we start, I think uh, let me acknowledge uh, acknowledgement of country. We would like to acknowledge the Virajuri, Nugunawal, Gundungara, and uh, Biripiri peoples of Australia who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Thanks for joining again uh, to today's uh, research colloquium. All right, we have two great presentations uh, today. First uh, presentation will be held by Dr. Elizabeth Yarbakş. Let me uh, briefly introduce her. She is a political anthropologist with an interest in contemporary Islam. She obtained her doctorate in 2017 from the Australian National University Center for Arab and Islamic Studies. Her, more her, her most recent publication, Iranian Hospitality, Afghan Marginality, Spaces of Refuge and Belonging in the of Shiraz, uh, published by Lexington uh, Books, was based on his extent, based on her extended field work on Afghan refugees in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And her presentation title is Afghan Migration and Iran's Weaning Hospitality, 1979 and today. Please, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, you know, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So, um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks to uh, Sizak for hosting me here today and, and to you, Hakan, for uh, your introduction there. Um, yes, yeah, so I um, undertook a period of um, field work in Iran, um, in the city of Shiraz, in the center, south center of Iran, um, in 2013 and 2014. Um, and my area of interest was um, around Afghan migrants and refugees who had been in many cases residing in Iran for quite an extended period of time um, and really looking at the way um, in which I suppose Iranian ideas around national identity, Iranian ideas around hospitality sort of intersected with um, the situation for Afghans in the country. Um, and I was taking a, a sort of historical approach to that looking at, at perhaps how that has shifted over time. Now um, when I sort of uh, came to prepare or, or think about um, this presentation, it, it was some time ago now, and I certainly um, hadn't anticipated just sort of how timely this would perhaps be um, in terms of, you know, again, Afghan, new Afghan, a new Afghan sort of wave of displacement um, in the current context. And I think, you know, we've all been watching um, the situation unfold in Afghanistan over the last few weeks um, and seeing those sorts of shocking and, and horrifying and heartbreaking images emerging from Afghanistan um, and, and particularly um, in the context of, of seeing Afghans attempt to flee the country um, in response to the, the return of the Taliban to power. Um, so while, you know, all eyes have been on Kabul since the middle of August, um, and and specifically, I suppose, on, on Kabul airport and seeing, you know, people desperate um, there to, to leave the country, um, there's really been a much broader humanitarian crisis, a much broader displacement crisis um, that's been unfolding across the country for a very long period of time, um, but certainly significantly um, over the last six months or so. So between um, January and August just of this year, um, it's estimated that half a million Afghans were forced from their homes, joining 2.9 million internally displaced peoples at the end of, of 2020. Now, the number of internally displaced Afghans is then um, less than even than the number of those who reside outside of Afghanistan. So um, over the past uh, four decades now, Afghan refugees have, have constituted um, the most expansive refugee population globally. 
And that's really been dwarfed only in, in recent years by population displacement um, precipitated by the Syrian civil war. Um, and, and, I, and I think that it would be fair to say that today Afghan, Afghans are sort of poised to once again um, acquire that dubious honour of being the largest refugee population. Um, certainly the, there is an anticipation um, that current events will see further waves of migration, further waves of exile from Afghanistan. Um, so the vast majority of Afghan refugees, as, as people may be familiar and aware of, uh, end up in, in one of two countries. So uh, first off, Pakistan. Um, most Afghan, the, the larger number of Afghan refugees end up in Pakistan and then followed closely by um, by Iran. And, and from this point, I'm sort of turning my attention specifically to that Iranian context. So um, Afghans have a, a long history of um, migration to Iran. There's a long history of interaction more generally between Iran and Afghanistan, the, the border between Iran and Afghanistan has only very recently been clearly demarcated, has shifted historically. Um, and although it, it's, although today it is clearly demarcated in terms of cartography, it, it still is um, a, a fairly porous border on the ground. Um, much of it running through sort of fairly inhospitable uh, desert. Um, an inhospitable landscape more generally. Um, so there's a long history of migration of Afghans, of movement in both directions, but specifically of Afghans into Iran. Um, beginning, I suppose, with the, the pool of, of holy sites in Iran, sort of pil pilgrimage to holy sites, um, most notably to the, uh, to the tomb of the Imam Reza in Mashhad, um, which is you know, located fairly close to the Afghan border. Um, and the first, so while there, while there is that longer history of, of pilgrimage, the first mass migration of Afghans into Iran dates back to the 1850s. Um, this was Hazara migration, so the Hazara ethnic, uh, ethnic group, 5,000 Hazara Afghans settled in Iran, um, again, in a fairly close to the border. Um, and uh, this was followed by further sorts of migrations through the late 19th century following a series of failed um, Hazara rebellions. Um, but modern migration, the modern migration of Afghans to Iran begins in the 1970s or the early, the early 1970s and really sort of took off with the um, 1973 oil boom across the Middle East, um, the subsequent growth in Iran's construction industry, which provided this sort of lure of, of well remunerated employment for Afghans. At the same time, it, it, as there were significant push factors from Afghanistan, drought, um, rising government taxes, um, uh, ethnic tensions. Um, now, the Iranian revolution, 1978-79 revolution, um, did mute that kind of economic imperative. Um, Iran was in a state of disarray. Um, under normal circumstances, this would perhaps have seen the migration of Afghans from into Afghanistan. However, of course, things were unfolding um, in Afghanistan at, at, at that very time. So the, the Saar revolution followed by 19, in April 1978, followed by the December 1979 Soviet invasion, and, and this is the point um, at which there is the, the, the beginning of the Afghan, the global Afghan diaspora, and certainly the beginning of the um, diaspora in Iran, the Afghan diaspora in Iran. Um, so December 1979, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and by 1981, so within, within two years, in less than two years, significantly less than two years, 3.7 million Afghans had fled Afghanistan. Almost all of them are sort of already sort of covered to, to neighbouring Iran and to Pakistan. Um, and over the period of the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan, so from 1979 up to 1989, Iran hosted 
probably up to 3 million Afghan refugees. Now, the numbers are not clear. We will talk through that a, a little further in a moment. Um, so from um, so from 1989, Iran continued to host very, very significant numbers of Afghan refugees, numbers of millions. Um, but from 2001, 2002 onwards, there was a, uh, a shift and an, and an attempt to broker a number of sort of, with the, with the assistance of um, international bodies, the UNHCR in particular, to broker the, uh, a number of voluntary repatriation programs and sort of try and um, uh, have Afghans return from Iran to Afghanistan. Um, and today, so at the end of 2020, um, the number of reg registered Afghans in Iran, the number of registered Afghan refugees in Iran um, stands at 780,000. And this is a number that, that is fairly clear and fairly um, well established that um, that, is, that is actually an accurate number. Um, while um, undocumented migrants and, and refugees, Afghan migrants and refugees are estimated to number up to 2 million, with you know, um, a great deal of uncertainty about what that might actually be. Um, so, you know, the intensification of conflict in Afghanistan through 2021 and now the return of the Taliban to power um, has sort of seen, you know, the refugee, Afghan refugee crisis has really seen for decades and, and looks like it will, will perhaps boil over um, once again. So the UNHCR has, all, has sort of urged the country's neighbours to keep their borders open um, and there's mixed kinds of evidence about whether Iran is heeding that call or not, or whether they will continue to heed that call or not. So as the government in Kabul collapsed, Iran began setting up temporary refugee camps along um, its eastern border. Um, this was a marked departure from the way that Iran has dealt with Afghan movement into Iran in the past in terms of whether people are, are placed in refugee camps or, or not. Um, and, and the statements from the um, Iranian Interior Ministry has been that Iran expects refugees to, to go back to Afghanistan when the situation improves. So keeping refugees in camps in order to facilitate their, their return um, once Iran deems the situation sufficiently improved. Um, and, and one of the reasons that, that they're sort of em already emphasising the need for return is, is the, um, you know, is the sense that any new influx um, of, of Afghan refugees at this point will add really significant strains and stresses to, uh, to the Iranian economy. Um, under US sanctions, and this is often sort of cited by Iran as a significant problem, um, drawing the, the Afghan uh, refugee situation into that um, broader sort of uh, Principle. wrangling over, over the applicability of sanctions. Um, but more specifically, the, the fear about stress on in. the Iranian healthcare system, um, which is and this is really a legitimate concern, which is utterly overwhelmed um, in, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there are really serious and legitimate worries about how Iran might um, cope in the current circumstances. Okay, so this... Um, um, there is already... Um, evidence just in the last few days that Iran is tightening its border crossings um, and that already there are figures in the government um, who are arguing that the situation in Afghanistan is stable, stabilising. Um, and 
the Afghan situation is um, interestingly and, and in a way that's sort of quite different to what's been seen in the past being drawn into the domestic um, politics of Iran in terms of the that hardline reformist split which so sort of underlies um, so much of the sort of domestic um, political situation in Iran. So there are sort of hardline figures in the government who are coming out um, saying uh, that the Taliban are a reformed um, group that um, they haven't specifically attacked um, Shia Afghans and, and that this is evidence that they are um, somehow a different uh, beast to the 90s um, and um, that Iran should, that Iran shares some, um, you know, ideological sympathies in terms of particularly anti-US sentiment and that um, therefore deals should be made just to protect Shia Afghans in Afghanistan but, but also to um, to make make and maintain the sorts of trade relationships that Iran has and has had with Afghanistan. Um, so um, while there is this kind of tension currently um, within um, Iranian politics around the sorts of um, all the politics of hospitality and politics of um, protection. Um, I, I guess through my research, I, I was identifying a different kind of tension um, between the imperative of hospitality and, and the reality of inhospitality um, that really shaped and circumscribed Afghan experience in Iran from the very outset. And just in the, the remaining time that I have this afternoon, I want to sort of trace the way in which notions of Iranian hospitality have tracked over and against that Afghan experience um, of, in, in, of inhospitality in Iran. Um, so I've already sort of talked through the time frame. the emergence of that global Afghan diaspora coincided with the establishment of the Islamic Republic um, with the revolution in Iran. Um, and so there were, from the very outset, um, ideological motivations on the part of the Iranian regime to sort of warmly embrace Afghan exile. So out of this, Afghans entering Iran in that very first wave of uh, refugees were nominated Mahajirin. Um, and, and the idea was that the sort of, um, underpinning idea there is that the one who welcomes the Mahaja is considered to be performing a you know, valuable religious act. So the welcome of Afghan refugees reinforced the Islamic credentials of the Iranian government while also really speaking forcefully to this pan-Islamic vision of the early um, Islamic leadership in Iran. Um, and, and not sort of to forget that concurrent to the Soviet invasion, um, of Afghanistan, the Iranian government was engaged in its own struggle with um, and its own military action against um, left-wing ideologues, people, th those with whom it had formerly been allied against the Shah but had now turned against. Um, so the Khomeini period, the, the Khomeini period in Iran, the 1979 to 1989 period is characterized um, by so-called open door policy. So um, notably and, and distinctly to, uh, distinct to Pakistan um, and distinct to the situation now in Iran, um, the country didn't establish vast refugee camps on the borders. So Afghan refugees were permitted to sort of enter the country with very few restrictions imposed on their movement, either across the border or inside the country. So while many did in fact um, settled in border provinces, hundreds of thousands dispersed through Iran, you know, finding employment, um, particularly in agriculture and construction, enrolling their children, um, male and female children in Iranian schools, um, and contributing in a whole myriad of ways to Iranian society. Um, not least 
of which was Afghan contributions to the Iranian war effort in the context of the Iran-Iraq war, which also um, unfolding at that time. Um, so between 1979 and 1992, a form of refugee status was sort of granted um, in a general sense, um, and it was granted to the vast majority of Afghans simply on the basis of their Afghan identity. Um, they were issued with uh, what were called blue cards at the time, um, indicating this, their status as Mahajirin. Um, and, and as uh, hospitality towards Afghans was really drawn into that um, Islamic um, and revolutionary discourse. So um, I'll unpack a little bit more about that Islamic discourse, but the revolutionary discourse, I suppose, was the notion of sort of oppressed nostalgia of the world um, and, and, the, um, and that kind of pan um, Islamic ideal that came out of the revolutionary. Um, out of that sort of revolutionary foundation as well. Um, so while policies developed in response to the influx of Afghan refugees through the 1980s did draw to a certain degree on international treaties and conventions of which to which Iran, um, Iran was party and to which Iran had in, uh, and of which Iran had incorporated into its constitution. Um, it simultaneously was referencing a whole of religious obligations. So, um, you know, Islam, from the outset, Islam, there was an imperative sort of enshrined um, for Muslims to flee injustice and unbelief and a corresponding sort of obligation on, on others to host those who were fleeing. Um, and we can say from that that the, the Yijra of the Prophet emerges as a sort of defining event of Islamic hospitality. Um, so the initial designation of Afghan refugees as Mahajirin references this notion of Islamic hospitality um, in specific ways. Um, and Khomeini was emphasizing at this time that the importance of Islam and the importance of the Islamic Ummah above and beyond the nation to the point of really rhetorically negating national borders. And, and in the context of Afghan refugees, this comes back to that idea of the open door, um, you know, a policy of um, welcome and, and, a, and of it, rhetorically at least sort of not recognizing the difference between um, Afghans and Iranians with the caveat that there was in, in fact and in reality um, a, a vastly different kind of experience on the ground. Um, now, at the end of the Iran-Iraq war and following the death of Khomeini, there was a real shift in Iran um, in terms of the prioritization of nation over Islam in the sort of formation of Iranian identity, of national identity. Um, and one of the concrete ways, there was a number of ways that this was manifested, but one of the concrete ways that it was manifested was in terms of a downgrading of Afghan refugees from Mahajirin with all that sort of religious inflection to a, a sort of you know, just a neutral term, a, a neutral term of Panahandagan, um, sort of refugee or asylum seeker. Um, and, and with this came a shift in the, the juridical sort of framework of asylum from something that was granted on mass on account of Afghan identity to it became a matter of individual claims. So in accordance with kind of international asylum uh, treaties around asylum seeking um, and international norms around asylum seeking. So um, now hospitality at this time sort of came to be referenced in quite different ways that were distinct from Islamic notions of hospitality and really drew on, on perhaps pre-Islamic ideas of the Iranian nation um, and the, the sort of notion that um, human rights, uh, um, that there was a, an equivalent, uh, there was a collapsing of sort of hospitality with human rights um, in terms of it being framed um, in the context of Iran's sort of long um, pre-Islamic history with a particular pointing to the figure of um, Cyrus the Great um, and to the the, the Cyrus Cylinder, the so-called Charter of Cyrus the Great, which is very often referenced and has sort of been mythologized and drawn into this idea, a, a 
as the first declaration of human rights. So a human, <laughs> with this collapsing of hospitality and human rights, you begin to see the sort of elevation of pre-Islamic history alongside, if not above, Islam, um, and, and a shift to a human rights-based approach to asylum, and in which individual claims then take precedence over, no, um, over notions of obligation to the Ummah. Um, so by March 2001, the Iranian government declared the border with Afghanistan sealed. Um, Afghans already resident in Iran were at this time required to register their presence in the country. This later evolved into a system of registration called the Amayesh system, whereby Afghans were made to apply for and renew their registration on a regular basis, six monthly, later yearly basis. And while at first that system appears to be a way of rendering Afghans legal and giving them a legal status in Iran, it, it sort of functioned equally well and, and continues to function equally well as a method of, of constructing and promoting illegality. So Afghans become illegal in a number of specific ways through this system. The first is, is those who enter or re-enter Iran after 2001. Um, and, and the second is in relation to the sort of arbitrary rules that apply that, that catch people out. Um, and, and the third is in terms of very high fees for registration and fluctuating fees, which makes it very hard for you know, economically vulnerable um, refugee populations to, to sort of keep up with this, the demands. Of this and, and out of this system, Afghans became really deportable subjects in Iran, subject to deportation for failing to be um, legally registered. So, last two decades are ramping up of repatriation efforts, um, and, and this is in terms of both an official voluntary, so called voluntary repatriation program. Um, and I, I say so called because really the idea that it can be voluntary where there is a um, you know, sort of increasing social pressures placed on Afghans um, to, to leave um, is really makes that idea of a voluntary repatriation somewhat questionable, but also deportation, so also involuntary repatriation. Um, so returns from Iran to Afghanistan have skyrocketed in recent years, and, and there's been a number of reasons for that. Um, so the country's, the, the Iranian economy has absolutely been in a downward spiral, um, derailed in part by US sanctions, um, in, you know, in part by domestic factors. Um, and then of course the COVID pandemic, which, is, which was, has been catastrophic in Iran and Iran has certainly suffered significantly um, in comparison to other countries in the region. Um, so many uh, returnees, Afghan returnees have said that soaring living costs um, have precipitated their return, but also growing hostility, um, which has forced them out of Iran. So, um, and, you know, for, for every um, two Afghans who, who return voluntarily, at least one is being um, involuntarily returned from Iran. Um, and now, of course, so this is very recent sort of events. Um, now, of course, Afghans are coming back or, or, you know, earlier this year, we could say that Afghans are coming back to a country facing numerous um, crises, multiple crises that are magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, um, levels of food insecurity are catastrophic in Afghanistan, have been catastrophic in Afghanistan, um, as is debt for those who have been displaced. Um, and this is on top, of course, of the long, longer running conflict in Afghanistan, um, which kills and, and through the period of, of US occupation of Afghanistan, killed or injured thousands of civilians every year. Um, and um, of course now, the return of the Taliban to power, which which um, has you know thrown all of these all of the thinking around um, around return of Afghans to Afghanistan into a very different place and pl and puts us on the brink perhaps of another a new crisis of Afghan displacement. Thank you. I'm very welcome. I'm very happy to take questions. You're very welcome to ask questions if that's how we're doing it, or I'm not quite sure what the plan is.
Yes, definitely, Elizabeth. Thank you so much uh, for your great presentation, and I think it is relevant to today's context and discussions. Uh, really, you know, on social media, on news, we see lots of discussions on Afghanistan uh, currently. Yes. Uh, now Q and A session. Now, do you have any questions? If you have any questions, please you can post to Elizabeth. Yes, Meshi. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth, for that uh, presentation, and it's, it is very relevant. Uh, interestingly, I'm currently writing about the history of um, white Australia policy and um, the Muslims in, in this country. So a lot of what you were saying sort of resonates very much directly to that part of our history. Just a question in relation to what's happening right now in Afghanistan and Iran. So you said that the government sort of opened up the camps already. So do you think that there's a change in attitude, it sounds like, from what you were saying in your assessment? Is the Iranian, are they more sort of um, hospitable now or open to uh, the hosting of the Afghan refugees in this current crisis? Or are, are they, you know, it's, it's just a temporary setup, as you said, and they're not really hoping to... So what are your assessments? And what are you, just another quick question, sorry, if I may, if you can also address how, what, what parallels do you see between um, countries, Muslim countries, majority countries like Iran, Turkey, and their attitudes towards refugees and, com and compare them to our uh, standards in Australia uh, and, and Europe, if, 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 if I may. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um... Okay, so is Iran, to answer the sort of first question, um, is Iran sort of be more hospitable at the present time? No, I don't think, no. So in this context, the, the opening of camps is not um, a sign of hospitality. It's actually a sign of, of managing movement um, in a much more sort of restricted way and, and, in, and ensuring the swift return of Afghans to Afghanistan um, at a point um, where it's deemed, you know, where, where either Iran feels that they uh, can no longer bear the burden of that or assess the situation as, as more perhaps threatening to Iran um, or balanced than, than the threat posed to, um, to Afghan refugees. Um, so, no, the camps are not, camps, I would say, are not a, a sign of, any new sort of thinking around hospitality um, or of welcome. Um, a pragmatic recognition that Afghans will enter Iran if they are able to, um, and that the border is porous, um, but, but certainly trying to manage that in a fairly restricted um, and careful way. Um, now, the second, your, the second question you've had there, really interesting, and I think you probably have some really good thoughts about that as well, given your area of research, which sounds fascinating. And, and um, uh, I guess it's something that I'm sort of turning my attention to a little bit more at the moment, um, partly out of the, you know, necessity, given the, the difficulties around conducting further research in Iran or, or abroad more generally at the moment. Um, so, yeah, how does it compare? How do these sorts of issues compare to um, Western, Australian, European um, responses to um, refugees, more generally to Afghan refugees in particular? Um, first off, I guess these are issues. So my the framework that I used for my research was hospitality, and the, this sort of framework of hospitality um, has been applied in particularly in the European context um, quite um, extensively, um, and of course has been applied with the understanding that hospitality is um, limited in very significant ways when it comes to um, the treatment of refugee and migrant populations. Um, so in some ways, I was taking a framework that had already been applied in the West and, and using it in, in partial ways in Iran. Um, so a few things. First off, um, Iran has borne a significant burden of refugee movement, as do countries neighbouring refugee you know, situations of, of crisis, usually. Um, and... In doing so, it has, um, you know, 
provided a buffer for perhaps uh, Western Europe for, for, for Turkey or for, for Western Europe. Um, the, the same sorts of issues around the way refugees are treated and seen do arise, um, and yet they're framed in different ways. So this shared, I suppose, cultural and, and religious um, foundations creates a different kind of um, understanding around what are the obligations, what are the expectations, um, what's the relationship between um, the, you know, Afghan refugees and Iranian citizens, Iranian hosts, Afghan refugee guests. Um, so while there is a great deal to sort of maybe criticise in terms of Iran's treatment of Afghan refugees, it, it shouldn't be divorced from a broader kinds of criticisms of the way that, that other countries have um, treated refugees, treated migrants, and also been very much protected from these kinds of mass um, refugee crises by virtue of geography, by virtue of wealth, um, and by their capacity to throw up borders and obstacles to, to the movement of people that are simply not possible for a country like Iran, you know, 900 kilometre border with Afghanistan um, and, and the limited capacity to, to kind of police that. Um, yeah, I don't know if that fully answers your question. I think there's so much that could be unpacked in terms of a comparison between Iran and other countries. And, and I think that that, um, you know, is a really interesting area. Okay, thank you, thank you. There's so much more to discuss, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Meshit, for your question and Elizabeth. Now, Dr. Mehmet Ozal, if, if you have any questions or uh, comments or reflections. Yes, I have a question about uh, the currently, there's a lot of Afghan uh, refugees going from, through Iran to Turkey mm -hmm. and possibly to Europe from there. And what can you say about, do you know anything about that? And what are the likely things to happen? Uh, yeah, so um, of course, it, one of the big um, stories at the moment in terms of, and I think Mashid has maybe posted something up there about, about this as well in the chat that people might wanna have a look at. Um, one of the big sort of stories that's coming out around the this, this element of the Afghan crisis, the, the displacement element and, and the, the, the perceived sort of threat of a refugee movement is that Turkey has thrown up significant, it was thrown significant effort into building and, and, and fortifying a border wall with, um, between Turkey and Iran in order to prevent the on movement of Afghans from Iran into Turkey. And from Turkey, presumably, you know, many would stay in Turkey, but from Turkey, presumably into Europe, into Western Europe. Um, so um, obviously there is, um, you know, a great deal of international kind of sympathy around the Afghan situation, but the reality of, of what that actually means in terms of any kind of practical, um, you know, expansion of refugee programs, also, and we've certainly seen that in the Australian context is much more is much more questionable, um, and and so ultimately it, it then lands, at, you know, on the Afghan people first and foremost, who who are then have no options, um, but then also on neighbouring countries like Iran and Pakistan who just don't have the capacity to throw up border walls, for instance, and already have huge populations of Afghans um, inside inside the country under enormous sorts of pressures in terms of the, the, the really poor economic situation in Iran, the poor, health economic, the poor health situation in Iran and the economic implications of that. Um, and so we're already perhaps in a very precarious situation in Iran and looking for other options. So, um, you know, at some point where a border gets thrown up, it, it, it means that, that the burden gets borne by somebody else, which ultimately, of course, is, is Afghan people themselves, but, but in the intermediate can be countries like Iran. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth and uh, Dr. Mehmet. Uh, any, do you have any other questions or you know, uh, feedback or comments or reflections? 
Uh, all right. I think uh, all is done, all is very good. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, the, well done. Great presentation. Uh, thank you for joining and contributing to this research colloquium. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any questions to Elizabeth, of course, uh, you can email her anytime. Yeah. And uh, for those who missed this colloquium, because we have some reg more registrations, uh, this colloquium is recorded and it will be available through uh, CISEC or through CISEC a web page called Sizek Think Space. All colloquiums and recordings are available. And anytime later, uh, if any academic or anyone who wants to listen to this, uh, these colloquium series, of course, uh, they can uh, listen and they can watch anytime. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Now, after uh, her, uh, Ismail Haskara, let me introduce him briefly. Uh, yes. Uh, just a second. Uh, Ismail Haskara now will be presenting his confirmation uh, seminar for his PhD research proposal. Currently, he is doing his uh, PhD in Islamic studies uh, through Sizek Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization, Charles Sturt University. Ismail Haskara started off uh, as professional career as a TESOL teacher, translator, interpreter, and later uh, became an expert in terrorism and security studies. After working as a TEFL lecturer at various universities in Turkey, he worked for various institutions as a translator and interpreter. Then in 2013, he, he started working for the Attorney General's Department in Australia as a language content analyst, analyst until 2017. And his ultimate goal after graduating will be to teach at a university in Australia or Turkey in a discipline that's relevant to his uh, acquired skills. Yes, uh, Ismail, Mr. Ismail Hakkar, Haskara. Yes, uh, do you have any presentation slides? Uh, I think you are muted, we don't hear you. Yeah, if you unmute your, yourself. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes so uh, I'll share screen. Yes, please. And then go ahead. Okay, so I'll go. Yep. Uh, is that all right? Yep. Yes, all right. Yes. So this is the... Um, um, this is the name of the, the, the well, the title of my um, presentation, Secularism in Turkey, the Nature of Change in Politics, Society and Religion Through the Prism of the Anet. So let's go to background. Um, the issue of religion and state is still unresolved in the Muslim world. The Taliban takeover in Afghanistan is the latest example. In the early 2000s, AK Party government in Turkey was seen as a model where democracy and religion could be in good balance. In the last 10 years though, Turkey and the government has shifted secularism more towards religion. We need to find out where this shift has taken place and to what extent. So let's go to slide three, which is the historical relationship uh, between state and religion in Turkey. Now, Established in 1924, during the second year of the modern-day republic, the INET was founded after the abolishment of the Sharia with Afkaf Vekaliti, which was a ministry, the Ministry of Religion, on March 3rd, 2024, which encompassed in itself the office of the Sheikh al Islam. What was once a ministry during its years as the Sharia with Afkaf Vekaliti had now become a directorate with duties to organize places of worship and to control acts of worship and matters of creed. This meant the founders of the Republic had now confined religious matters into a directorate, a lesser organization than a ministry, allowing them to observe and control religion in society. So next slide is um, the underlying uh, reasons behind the adoption of secularism. Turkey's decision to modernize has historically been due to its falling behind European and Western power. The founding leaders believed that the best way to modernize was through controlling religion and removing it from the public sphere. 
So let's go to literature. So um, among many relevant publications related to my research topic, six prominent scholars that stand out have been chosen. Nilofer Göle, in her 1997 article, Secularism and Islamism in Turkey, the making of elites and counter elites, brilliantly demonstrates how staunch secularism has divided society and polarized it. Moreover, Göle highlights uh, in her 1997 article, a key element of my study, which is Turkey's recent rethinking of how secularism should be exercised. Although most of her observations are accurate, Göle regards feminism and environmentalism as recognizing pluralism, while claiming that Islamist movements aim at a complete change that can threaten secularism, which I believe should be taken as an issue of heated debate. Reason for this is, like um, feminism in Turkey is uh, approached differently to that in Europe. It's more of a Western of uh, thing which doesn't really um, support full freedoms of everyone. In his prestigious book, Islamic Political Identity, Identity in Turkey, Hakan Yawaz elaborates on the secular versus conservative polarization by saying that throughout Turkey's history, the state has considered large sections of its own society rather than foreign countries as its main threat. Hakan Yawaz and Nihat Özcan in their acclaimed article, Crisis in Turkey, the Conflict of Political Languages, highlights another fact by contending almost all criticism of the Kemalist version of secularism and nationalism are threatened as hostile voices of religious fanaticism. Moreover, Yawaz and Özcan claim any potential drift towards a more religious state uh, causes waves of concern throughout the secular establishment. Yawaz's observations in regards to secular resistance against the religiously motivated politics in Turkey is nothing less than brilliant. Another prominent scholar, Ishtar Gözaydin, in her much cited article, The Restructuring of Religious Services, the Relationship Between State and Religion, outlines that the Diyanet was founded to prevent the obstacle of Islam and given two crucial roles, to provide public service and to control the public servants providing this service, emphasizing the control aspect. Gözaydin brilliantly portrays the ideological factors behind the establishment of the Dianet of social engineering. In her renowned book, Dianet and Politics, Muslim World, Gözaydin brilliantly portrays the ideological factor of social engineering behind the establishment of, establishment of the Dianet. In her article, Dianet, the distribution of religion in Turkey, Gözaydin contends that these measures were taken to make Turkey more contemporary. Gözaydin quotes from Akseki, the third president of the Diyanet, that the founding members' objectives were to, were to create good citizens with civic responsibility rather than Muslim consciousness, given that the majority of the Muslim population in Turkey are followers of the Sunni denomination of Islam, and the Diyanet is an institution that represents Sunni Islam only, the state's role towards non-Muslim minorities within the context of Diyanet is an area that needs further research. For almost a century, the issue of state recognition of the Alevis has been in deadlock. Alevis are a Shia sect, uh, which is another excellent basis for conducting further research into the challenges and issues related to how the INET is supposed to support Alevis in Turkey. Now, Çağaptay and Aktaş, in their book, How Erdoganism is Killing Turkish Democracy, focuses, focuses on the shift in Turkish society by claiming that the AK Party's authoritarian and nationalist policies have shifted Turkey towards political Islam, authoritarianism, and Turkish nationalism, which have now become integral pieces of Erdoganism, blending post-colonial theory with anti-Westernism. If you go into the AK Party website, there's a, a link there under the heading Erdoganism. So yeah, it's interesting. Although Chaptai elaborates very successfully on the current political, cultural, and religious course that Turkey has adopted, there are information gaps in regards to the future of Kemalism, the CHP, and the nationalist movement who are actually trying to redefine themselves. Another prominent scholar, Isan Yilmaz, Hojam, you are there. 
In his book, Creating the Desired Citizen, Ideology, State and Islam in Turkey, he elaborates further on the ideological motivations of the secularist founders. Yilmaz provides valuable insight on Ataturk's positivist and social Darwinist ideology, laying emphasis on the being and the physical. In this regard, the Sunni aspect of the last identity as identified by Yilmaz Hocam is contradictory. To me, I need, uh, uh, unless he can elaborate that to me later on, we can get in touch. In this regard, the Sunni aspect of the last identity as identified uh, to the founding Kemalist philosophy of Turkey in that the Kemalists totally rejected religion. Um, Yilmaz and Bashirov in their article, uh, the Ak Party after 15 years emergence of Erdoganism in Turkey while claiming that Erdogan and Atatürk are similar in that they both want to create a society that suits their ideology and character. Also claim that political rhetoric is shifting from communism to Erdoganism, which can be considered as a shift from staunch French secularism or French style secularism to more tolerant English style secularism. So from the control aspect to the separation aspect of secularism, even though a shift towards a separationist account of secularism has been identified, research in relation to a unique type of secularism, Turkish secularism that would take into consideration Turkish culture and Islam to suit the needs of the Turkish population along the two main political spectrums. Uh, the two main sp the political spectrums here are the uh, nationalist, secular, and the conservative, uh, religious. And so this is underexplored. Uh, Semiha Topal, in her much cited article, Everybody Wants Secularism, but which one? Contesting definitions of secularism in contemporary Turkey highlights Turkey's shift towards a more lenient understanding of secularism, emphasizing that Kemalist interpretation of secularism seeks freedom from religion, whereas the Erdogan's Ak Party representing the conservatives and the people of Turkey seeks freedom of religion, so from to of. With this alleged shift towards a different understanding of secularism, the social, political and religious repercussions around art party policies related to uh, the future role of the Dianet is another excellent basis for conducting further research into the challenges and issues related to this topic. So let's have a look at the research questions on what we want to answer. So this is the research question. What is the nature of change in politics, society, and religion in Turkey between 2011 and 21? The case of Diane. So we, we want to identify where secularism and its relations with Islam politics and society was before the AK party rule. And then uh, to, we want to identify where secularism and its relations with Islam politics and society is today in the seemingly absolute AK party rule. And is there a shift between one and two? If so, what is the nature and scale of this shift? What are the social, religious, and political factors involved in this shift? Now, let's have a look at theoretical framework. Um, so I just want to focus on the two forms of secularism up for debate in Turkey. So the assertive French secularism, freedom from religion, state controlled, and then the passive British secularism. Although there are many kinds of secularism, uh, Isan Ojam in his book, um, Creating the Desired Citizen, um, brilliantly um, outlined all these, but we want to focus on two. The passive secularism, freedom of religion. Separation aspect is more predominant here than the control aspect uh, in the assertive French one. So, it was a French form of secularism through which the founders decided to abolish the visual aspects, aspects of Islam. They believed through this assertive secularism, they could push aside differences with the West that had been in place for centuries. However, with this assertive secularism, the control factor of religion has generated the rift between the secularists and the conservatives where secularists deemed themselves as progressive, accusing the conservatives of being backward. With the emergence of the Ak Party, Certain scholars believe that Turkey is rethinking its new secular model toward the British model, the passive one. So um, in this research, I will be using uh, Ernst Wolfgang Birkenford's secularism theory of open-ended neutrality. So Birkenford in his um, 
famous dictum contends that the liberal secularized state draws its life from preconditions it cannot itself guarantee. This means that restricting religious freedoms would undermine the very character of the state itself. Open neutrality needs to be tested in both ways, religion not interfering in state matters and the state not interfering in religious matters. So in his renowned book, A Secular Age, Charles, Charles Taylor contends that secularism needs to be libertarian where both the buffered, he calls the secular people buffered and the enchanted, the religious people, can lead their ordinary lives and pursue their own economic ends with confidence. The countries that conform with this form of secularism, like England, Australia, uh, are called, are uh, described as religiously plural. So Birkenford actually takes matters further by emphasizing that the extent to which religious freedom is realized in a given state indicates the extent to which the state is fully secularized. So his views on religious freedoms, are, well, I've got four here, in the right to have a religious faith, to profess this faith privately or publicly. So all these are secularism according to him. To exercise one's religion publicly and to associate with others to form a religious group. The four objectives of this research outlined in slide seven will be tested in accordance to these four parameters of religious freedoms as identified by Birkenford. Now let's move on to um, impact and significance. So this is what I've got here. By adding clarity to this previously under-explored uh, social, religious, and political theme and readdressing them with Birkenford's theory of open-ended neutrality, this research has the potential to reduce misunderstandings and create better social cohesion within Turkish society. Let's have a look at methodology. Here we go. So we've got a mixed uh, methodology involving quantitative and qualitative research techniques. The study will analyze a political, social and religious discourse of the lived experience of the Turkish population through deductive reasoning and discourse. Um, it will involve content analysis, collection of a broad range of texts such as media, news articles and op-eds and thematic analysis to determine themes from the hutbas and yeah, conclusions from collected data will be drawn by weaving together new information into theories. So our data sources is the next slide. So the thesis will adopt purposes sampling based on my knowledge of the nature of the research aims. On the based on my knowledge and the nature of the research aims. Data will be collected from not only deviant cases, but also cases who uh, 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 publications that carry a balanced approach. So uh, case one, uh, we've got four key events of religious emancipation between 2011 and 2021. These will be examined holistically, Primary data constrained to within a one month time frame after their occurrence will be used to extract immediate and compulsive reactions to these key events. 45 sources, such as news articles, op-eds, media publications, government communication for each key event. 15 from conservative, 15 from the secular and 15 from the political, politically neutral, sorry, will be analyzed. So what are these four key events? Um, so we've got the first one, all these key events are uh, directly re related to religion and uh, personal freedoms. So the first one is the two, October 2013 removal of the headscarf ban. Those women who chose not to remove their head covering uh, had been excluded from government office and educational opportunities. Before this ban, Erdogan stressed it was wrong for the state to impose a certain ideology on its people. The second one, the memorandum allowing Muslims to attend Juma prayers, although it was for public servants only, the lifting of this ban, it became exemplary for the private sector as well. The third one is recognition of Muslim clerics as married celebrants. Prior to this, because the state did not recognize religious and de facto relationships, 
in a patriarchal society like Turkey after divorce, the, it, would, it was the woman that would usually end up as the victim or being victimized. And the fourth event is the reopening of Hagia Sophia as a mosque in July 2020. Converted to a museum in 1934 by Ataturk, Hagia Sophia had been perceived um, as a violation of Turkish sovereignty by the conservatives. It was reinstated as a mosque after the state lost a lawsuit against the conservative charity organization. In the second case study, we've got the Dianet Hutpas. After analyzing all the Hutpas of the last 10 years, the most relevant 15 for every year, totaling 150 Hutpas for the 10 years, will be selected and analyzed through thematic content and latent analysis. For example, martyrdom will be taken as a node defined in its context, because it means uh, it might mean something different to the secular and something different to the uh, conservatives. Then analyze to unearth the ideology of each spectrum. The results will then be cross-matched through discourse to reveal the phenomenon. And then we've got media case uh, study. Turkish media news articles, op-eds on secularism will predominantly be divided into three sections. As I had stated before, the conservative, the secular nationalist, and the neutral, politically neutral, eight articles from 12 writers from 11 different media sources will be analyzed. The media news articles, op-eds, and the Dianet sermons will initially be analyzed separately and coded using NVVO QSR application. The collected data will be evaluated to appropriately formulate an understanding of the society being studied. Now, next, we've got the chapter outline, introduction, the research question, and then we've got the four key events, case studies, the Anet sermons, debate on Turkish secularism. Yeah. And then timeline. This is approximate, of course. Inshallah, 2023 is my HEDEF target. And references. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think very clear uh, presentation, very informative. Um, lots of uh, literature and resources uh, on the topic. Uh, all right. Uh, before, yeah, uh, Dr. Mehmet, should we start with uh, Professor uh, Isan Yilmaz or uh, me? Yes, please. Yes. All right. Yes, please. Uh, Professor Isan Yilmaz uh, is one of the experts in Australia and international known in this area. Yes, uh, Professor Yilmaz, if you provide some general feedback to uh, Ismail Haskara, then after the colloquium, we will have a private panel and we can discuss more in detail. Uh, yes, of course. Thank you, Ismail, for this. And this is an Thank important you, point, of course. Uh, I have a few comments. Inshallah, uh, I'm um, yeah. They mean a lot to me, your <laughs> feedback. <laughs> uh, thank you. The first question that comes to my mind is about the title. Uh, you talk about Dianet, uh, you look at the issue from the lens of Dianet, but yeah. the events that you'll be covering, the four ones, I, uh, Hagia Sophia, Headscarf, Mage issue, these are bigger issues than Dianet, and Dianet actually is not at the center of these uh, issues. These issues are very important and they are very relevant as far as uh, your work on secularism is concerned here. Yes. Yes. But Dianet either played a very minimal role in these discussions or they were very marginal. So the debate around these issues actually was not about Dianet. So instead of, and also I looked at your chapters and in only one of the chapters you are closely looking at the Diana case, the sermons, etc. And in the fifth chapter, for instance, you are looking at the uh, debates and discussions in the media yeah. uh, around these issues. So maybe Diana still could be included in this thesis, but maybe just remove it from the uh, title and just say Turkish secularism, uh, has it been changing? What's the nature of this transformation? What is the difference between pre-AKP era and, and today? 
I don't know. This is just a suggestion that came to my mind. Um, I'll note this, Hocam. I'll note this. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. your theoretical framework. Um, I'm not aware of the work that you've mentioned here, Water, that he applied uh, the German philosophers uh, or theoreticians uh, theory to Turkey. I haven't hmm. read this work. I am not aware of this, but I, I can wonder, send that to you, Hocam, in inshallah, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, do you have to limit yourself to this one single scholar? Because many people have been working on these issues, and you rightfully cited Charles Taylor, for instance. Yes, yes. And so you can just look at the issue from the perspective of secularism. And um, this is a huge theory, and many people have been working on it. And in the chat function, function I mentioned Ahmed Kuru. We looked at this issue comparing the United States, uh, Turkey, and France, and looking at the passive and assertive secularisms. So, because as far as you uh, wrote in your concept paper or the, the colloquium document, I really couldn't understand what makes this person or his theory important your, for your thesis. The, the four conditions that you talk about here, these are just general observation as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. um, this is about wall of separation in the United States. The religion wouldn't interfere with state affairs and state wouldn't interfere with religious affairs. So this is not just specific to this uh, person. I don't know, just have a closer look. As I said, I haven't read this work. So maybe they are talking about some deeper issues that I'm not aware of. And all, another observation, you talk about quantitative analysis, but I couldn't see this in your document. So yes, you'll be looking, uh, you'll be doing content analysis, you'll be looking at some nodes and you, you will use NVivo, okay. So you'll be analyzing the social, uh, not social, uh, the, the columns, the opinion pieces of these columnists in mm -hmm. different media organizations, yes. And also the sermons, mm -hmm. but where is this quantitative analysis? You just mentioned it at the top and mm -hmm. then you de did not um, explain it. Uh, maybe you can explain this uh, later in the, when you are responding. Inshallah, yeah, uh, because, um... Yeah, um, it involved uh, media analysis, um, which was quantitative, but I'll have another look into that, Hojam, inshallah. Okay, and another point uh, about uh, the columnist that you've chosen, and I wonder what criteria you have used, exclusion and inclusion criteria. And you mentioned a, a columnist from Jumuriyet newspaper, and I haven't heard this name before. So mm. is she is she talking about Dianet a lot? That is that the reason why you chose him? Or you have Özışık brothers, both of them? Yeah. The notorious guys. Are they so important? Why? And, and on the other hand, you excluded Yasin Aktay, who was the a deputy president of a deputy chairman of the AKP, spokesperson of AKP, is a sociology professor. He has been a regular columnist in Yeni Shafak for ages. He is one of the mm -hmm. ideologues mm -hmm. of uh, AKP. So why are you not looking at? Because you are talking about secularism, and he, half of his uh, writing is about secularism. And another one is mm -hmm. Yalçın Akdoğan, for instance. He has been this, uh, in the A team of Erdogan since the beginning. He yeah. was also deputy prime minister, etc. And he's been a regular columnist as well. Why is he not there? And Hayrettin Karaman, the guy, mm -hmm. the, the chief fatwa giver of Erdogan, he's not there. I don't know. So you need to clarify your criteria okay. and tell okay. us why you've chosen these columnists and you excluded others. At this stage, these are my comments, and I'll have a few more questions later. Inshallah, inshallah. Okay. All right. Uh, Professor Ilma, thank you so much for this constructive feedback. I'm sure uh, Mr. Ismail Haspakar, you know, did this feedback will be very helpful to develop it further. Of course, uh, you are in, in you are at the beginning of your research, and right guidance and constructive feedback will help you throughout the journey. Otherwise, if this was 
at the end of the research, it could be different, very difficult. Uh, all right, yes, yes. Uh, Professor Ismail Albayrak is uh, other reviewer, but he couldn't join today because of his other program. But let me just briefly provide some feedback from uh, his report. Then after that, uh, audience, you can ask any questions or any reflections. Let me have a uh, let me read some uh, uh, feedback comments from Professor Ismail Albayrak. Uh, he thinks that I th the candidate is working on a significant, very important research issue. And this study deals with the visibility of the religion and which started with IKP period and the relationship of this visible religiosity with tradition Turkish style of secularism. The candidate, just as a recommendation for uh, for significance of this research, the candidate should explain his preference between 2011 to 2021 in a little, little more detail. In particular, he should state the reasons for the starting year, why he why it is starting 2011. Yeah, yeah. What is the reason uh, it is starting? Uh, actually, research uh, focuses from the you know 2011. Uh, he suggests. In terms of literature review, says literature review is very rich. Uh, candidate cl critically considers available uh, resources, uh, and he says just as a recommendation. Uh, no need too much biblical uh, bi bibliographical sources. Uh, too many literature literature materials can create a tidying problem when the chapters of the thesis are started to be written. And he thinks that a theoretical framework and German legal scholars a theory of state neutrality. Uh, he thinks that uh, suitable, very suitable for this re research, as far as he understands. As a recommendation, uh, Professor Yilmaz also recommends uh, for the literature the work of Ahmed Kuru. He also suggests uh, works of Professor Ahmed Kuru from the USA, uh, he, who has become a brand, especially in Turkey and secularism, should be evaluated in this research. Yeah. Uh, in terms of research questions, uh, he has some recommendations. I will. I, we will we will send you this report, all right, in detail. Research questions are more like statements than concrete questions, and uh, he suggests that the thesis should have a main research question. Then, after the two or three uh, additional sub questions to support this main question, uh, he suggests some questions. You know, you will see uh, when you receive the document when you receive uh, the report. As a recommendation, uh, free formulation of the questions uh, is recommended, he says. Uh, and as I said, some recommendations for the uh, research, for the questions. And methods and techniques adopted are appropriate. The candidate nicely summarizes the method and methodologies he will follow in the research. And he will apply the mixed methods preferred in many social uh, studies. Uh, as a recommendation, he says some of the topics in the methodology section are not appropriate here among this recognition of Muslim clerics as marriage celebrants, memorandum uh, allowing Muslims to attend Juma prayers, etc. And he thinks that candidate demonstrates that research will make a, a actually original contribution to knowledge and understanding and professional practice. And he also uh, believes that proposal demonstrate a sufficient high standard of literary quality, although he strongly recommends the candidate uh, proofread his proposals and uh, future chapters. Proofreading and editing would be good as there are few you know, errors, you know, not much, but few errors such as Gulen congregation rather than Gulen movement, you know, Gulen congregation or Jumha, you know, instead of Juma, uh, just uh, some minor. Uh, errors, but candidates uh, outlines a, a clear and realistic timeline. He he liked a uh, timeline as well. Very wise and realistic timeline is provided by the candidate. Uh, I think that should be enough for from Professor Albayrak's side. Uh, how about if we uh, if ask the audience attendance if you have any questions to Ismail uh, or any uh, comments about his topic? Yeah, please. You can pose your questions. 
All right, any any questions? Yeah, I just want to say, Isanujam, I'll, um, I've noted those um, writers <laughs> that you've told me about Hayret and Karaman and uh, Yasin Akhtai. Um, I believe you're spot on. I'm going to consider those, and I've noted those, um, uh, your uh, suggestions. Yeah, just wanted to tell you that. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Any any uh, questions or feedback or uh, comments on uh, on the topic? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, Elizabeth, please. Yeah. Hi. Um, yes. Look, I just wanted to say it sounds like you've got a really interesting, you know, thesis topic. Some really good ideas in there. Um, and I really just wanted to, this is not really a question, I just wanted to say to, to wish you the very best of luck with this as you're in the early stages of it and, and obviously you. a long haul ahead. Um, but do, you know, do listen to what the supervisors are saying there. I think they did have some good feedback to you. Absolutely. And I, I think they're saying you're going to take it on board. So, you know, hear what people are saying and, and um, that this is the way that you get the very best thesis and the very best sort of experience, research experience is by drawing on that expertise. But um, yeah, a really good topic. I think that there's some really good bones there and you've got something interesting. Um, so I, I do wish you all the very best of luck. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. It means a lot to me. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah, any questions uh, or any Maybe, comments? Uh, yes. Yes. As Ismail's principal supervisor, uh, one of Ihsan's suggestions was to not to be too Diana focused. Uh, th that is, uh, uh, I guess, it's possible to do that. Uh, so we were, or Ismail was thinking that uh, Diana could be a kind of like a a measure, something to measure to how its role changed. Um, so, um, what would you what would you recommend, Ifsan, uh, in in addition to should 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 Dianet be lifted altogether in your recommendation, no. or in no. addition to Dianet, we should look at other things? Uh, Dianet, I don't think it's the measure alone. Why? Because. Uh, the audio is gone. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah I think uh, it is related to his internet, I think, not stable. Okay. Just, I think we should wait. Uh, for... uh, uh, sorry, uh, Ifsan, we can't hear you. We, we, we can't hear you. Uh, I think you have a poor line there, maybe. Yes, yeah. That's okay, maybe, like, we could... Thanks. No, okay. I, I moved to another room. Uh, the, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. So the, if you look at the content of the Annette's sermons and their reports, speeches, etc., there is a huge shift. There is a transformation in terms of ideology. But if you are looking at the issue from the perspective of secularism, actually nothing has changed. So the Annette was a state apparatus and they were getting their orders from the politicians, rulers, it's the same. So there wasn't any True. world separation. Yeah. There was a sort of one-way street. So Dianet was open to the orders from the politicians. They were following their agenda, but politicians wouldn't get any feedback or any orders from Dianet, religious authorities. I think it's the same. I don't think Erdogan is getting advice from Dianet. It, he's just using it like the Kemalist. So mm -hmm. Dianet still could be used, but just one of the instruments. So, but looking at the sermons, it could only be helpful if they talk about the state structure, uh, lawmaking, um, legislation, etc., because this is in relation to secularism. Mm -hmm.
but just a moment. Yeah, while you uh, while you're changing the room, Ihsan, uh, yeah, I, I guess I do understand that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the items, uh, the four items, Hagia Sophia, headscarf, married celebrants, these are important issues, and there are a few issues related to the constitutional court in relation to these. So how the constitutional court actually has changed its stance on these issues. So these are all related to uh, secularism. So he can he can include these things. Um, and also the place of the head of the Dianet, it's been changing de facto, not in, in the written law, but now in the in the state celebrations, etc., he, the Anet, head of the Anet, is now before the chief of staff, military chief of staff. So he can look at all these changes and, uh, and how secularism is evolving in Turkey. So the Anet could still be used, but I think he needs to look at a few other issues. Inshallah, Hocam. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, finally, if you have any comments, feedback, or any questions, you can uh, ask to Ismail Haskara. If you don't have, uh, maybe now the, we, we should finalize the colloquium uh, now. This is the end of the colloquium. Thanks for joining today uh, to this September research colloquium organized by Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization. Today we had great presentations. Uh, Elizabeth and Ismail, thank you so much for your contributions and for your presentations. And we will have a final research colloquium in November. Of, uh, uh, we will start to advertise uh, the final one as well. Thank you again. Hope to see you again in the last colloquium. And just uh, Professor Isan Yilmaz uh, and uh, Ismail's supervisors, if you leave behind others, please, uh, you can disconnect from this Zoom. Thank you so much. Looking forward to meeting you again uh, in another research colloquium. Thank you so much.